Today on Let Me Be Frank, Bishop Caggiano is joined by Dr. Peter Kilpatrick, the president of Catholic University of America. This conversation spans the topics of education, higher education, faith and reason, science and God. It is truly a fascinating, fascinating time. So keep your radio here at 1350 AM or at 103.9 FM, or keep us on the Veritas app on your phone. If you're listening to Let Me Be Frank on your podcast, please go to your podcast platform and give us a five-star rating and help us reach more souls. Let Me Be Frank is brought to you by a grant from Foundations in Faith. Foundations of Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport. Resources focus on energizing lifelong faith formation and discipleship and fostering a commitment to justice and accompaniment with our most vulnerable, from seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities. The reach is broad and the impact is meaningful. For more information, visit them on the web at foundationsinfaith.org. Okay, here we go. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. I'm Steve Lee, and it is my great pleasure, as always, to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Steve, good morning. Good morning, and happy Easter to you. Happy Easter, And to all our listeners. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Here we are. We can finally say the, the A word again. <laughs> oh, the A word. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Although technically we're taping before Easter, so we have to be careful there's no lightning bolts or anything happens. <laughs> right, exactly. Which is why I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We have a fascinating guest today. I am very excited. This is this is going to be fantastic. So we are very pleased to be joined by Dr. Peter Kilpatrick. Dr. Kilpatrick was appointed president of Catholic University of America in March uh, March 2022, and he took office on July 1st, 2022. Before that, he was provost and senior vice president for academic affairs at the Illinois Institute of Technology from 2018 to 2022, and previously served as professor and McCloskey Dean of Engineering at the University of Notre Dame. Before he did all that, Dr. Kilpatrick was on the faculty of North Carolina State University in uh, chemical engineering for 24 years. He is the author of more than 100 refereed journal articles in the wow. areas of deep breath, colloid and interfacial science, emulsion, si emulsion science, and molecular self-assembly, particularly as they apply to energy and to bio-separations. And Dr. Kilpatrick holds or shares 12 patents. Dr. Kilpatrick and his wife, Nancy, are the parents of four adult children, and we are delighted to have you on. Thank you for joining us, Dr. P Kilpatrick. Great to be here with you, Steve. Yeah, no, no, yeah, you're most welcome, my friend. I'm going to call you Patrick. I'm going to take the liberty to call you Patrick, if you don't mind. Peter. P oh, Peter, I'm sorry. Peter. Um, so your background is engineering then? That's correct. Ah. So how does your faith journey lead you from engineering to the presidency of the Catholic University of America? Well, I'd, I'd have to share with you how I came to faith. I'm, Please. I'm an adult convert. Um, when I was uh, a little kid growing up in West Texas, my dad was in the military, um, and we were stationed at, at an Air Force base in Texas. Uh, I had a little bit of a spiritual awakening. I, I had a good friend who was a son of a preacher, a uh, preacher kid, and named Larry Mosley, and he introduced me to the Bible when I was 10. And I remember asking my parents if I could uh, get a copy of the Bible story, which was a 10-volume set of illustrated stories of the Bible. And so I had this, again, I had this spiritual awakening. And then um, we moved away from Texas, and I sort of fell away from my spiritual awakening, but it never left me. Um, and I would say I was a non-practicing Christian uh, when I met my wife in, in school uh, in California, uh, and she wanted to get married in the church. She was a cradle Catholic. And so I signed a form agreeing to raise our children Catholic under duress. I, I said, you know, they should 
have the ability to make their own decisions, right? Uh, freedom and love, right? And uh, the pastor said, nope, uh, if you want to get married in my church, you got to sign this form. So under duress, I signed it. We, we uh, were happily married in the church. We went off uh, to graduate school. Three years later, we had our first child, Elizabeth. And my wife reminded me, she said, you know, we promised we would raise the kids Catholic. And so I'm like, okay, by the way, we neither one had been going to church for those three years. We go off to the local parish there in Minneapolis. And the priest says, uh, I don't think I've ever seen you here before. Uh, and you really need to be practicing for us to baptize your, your daughter. And I was kind of like, wow, was that in the fine print or did I miss something? <laughs> and so I went to my, my very first mass in several years and the homily just won me over. It was a homily about life. Uh, it was a beautiful homily <clears throat> delivered by an elderly priest. And I just have to tell you, it was a grace-filled moment. And uh, I've had the faith Every day of my life for 43 years because of that homily, and wow. I, I feel very blessed. Um, wow! So that's how I came to the faith. So how did how did I come from having the faith and being an engineer to being a university president? Mm. Um, well, I I would just tell you that God keeps saying, "Come and follow me." Um, I was a happily a happy uh, professor at NC State. Uh, Notre Dame came knocking on my door. Uh, a lot of universities had tried to recruit me away from NC State, and my wife had always said no because we had our kids in school in North Carolina. And uh, our oldest daughter was in high school. She was a senior in high school. And my wife finally said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I don't really know what I want to do. I uh, So I talked to my spiritual director, and he said, well, What's best for your family and what does God want you to do? And that led me to Notre Dame. Uh, and then I got led to Illinois Institute of Technology. And then I was going to retire. And a very close friend of mine at Notre Dame, a gentleman named Carter Sneed, who's a law professor there, said, uh, called me one day about two and a half years ago. And he said, Peter, uh, the Catholic University of America is looking for a new president. You'd be great at it. You should go uh, apply for the job. I said, Carter, I'm I'm not a spring chicken anymore. I, you know, I I'm thinking of hanging up my uh, my spurs here. And he said, the church needs you. You need to go to the Catholic University of America. And he kind of badgered me until I applied. And I really applied just to get him off my back. And then they invited me for an interview, and I came and fell in love with the place, found out what this interesting place called Catholic University of America was all about and decided this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what wow. I'm supposed to be doing. So wow. that's, so I, I, I really feel like uh, God's in control and uh, is putting people and things in my life that just lead me to where I'm supposed to be. Right. You know, it's a remarkable uh, account, uh, Peter, because that one homily, it shows the power of encountering Christ in the least likely moments of our lives, mm. where grace just breaks in. Because I'm sure when you walked into church, you had no expectation of what was going to happen. Mm -mm. Right? Yeah. it's uh, And I've, I've learned over time to be ready for the unexpected, or to try to be ready for the mm -hmm. unexpected. Mm -hmm. To every time I meet someone or have an encounter of some kind, I'm I'm always thinking, what does what does God want me to get out of this? What does want God want me to put into this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't always uh, respond as well to grace as I would like to, but at least I'm learning to let Him lead the dance. Yeah. And I think that's a lifetime project. It's true for me. <laughs> it's true for everyone, right? It's a lifetime project. You used a, an interesting phrase, preacher kid. Is yeah. that what the children of like the Protestant preachers are called? Absolutely. <laughs> Is that right? I never heard that before. PK. A preacher PK. kid. Oh, well, look at that. Yeah. Okay, it's a you very, live and learn. <laughs> it's a common Protestant 
terminology. Wow. So now you are at the head of Catholic University of America. Chances are some of our listeners have heard it of it, but don't really know it. So give us some background. What is, why is this university so important? Well, it's, it's a unique col- uh, Catholic university in America because it was founded by the bishops of the country in 1887 at the request of the bishops. Uh, it was founded under a papal charter. Pope Leo XIII chartered the university, and it was founded as a university of pontifical right, a so-called pontifical university. And so if you go to almost any other country in the world, Korea, the Catholic University of Korea, the Catholic University of Chile, of Portugal, of you know Poland, uh, there are pontifical universities that were founded as pontifical universities all around the world Mm -hmm. and were the only one in the United States. So Mm -hmm. all the other Catholic colleges and universities were founded typically by religious orders, uh, like Mm -hmm. the Jesuits or the Franciscans or the Congregation of Holy Cross. Uh, But this Mm -hmm. is the only one that was founded by in the heart of the church, Mm -hmm. uh, from the heart of the church. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, Like many universities, we followed a a process of, uh, I call it depontificalizing in the 70s. Uh, But we're actually interested in going back to our roots and reapplying to be a pontifical university because I'm a big believer that it's important for universities to get in touch with their, their identity at the heart of their mission and live that identity in a unique way. And that's what makes us unique. Mm -hmm. Um, So for many, you know, many years, we were the university that educated the bishops. Uh, So over a hundred bishops, both current and retired, have their advanced degrees from our university. Uh, We've had a seminary here, theological college, uh, for nearly a hundred years. Five of our alumni are up for canonization. Um, you know, it's just, it's a unique university. It's, there's nothing quite like it. And mm-hmm. that's why we're called the Catholic University, university of America. University of America, yeah. Oh, I didn't realize five alumni are up for, for canonization. Yeah. Would you recall some of them, who they are? Uh, Thea Bowman. Uh, oh. Yeah. For, uh, Fulton Sheen. I guess Fulton was a professor here. Uh, oh, and, and right. but I think he was also an alumnus, um, mm-hmm. and I'm going to struggle to remember all of them. No, but- that's okay. Just the two are fine because I didn't realize Thea Bowman. Yeah, well, that's quite quite a legacy up to even this point, right? For the university, it's 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 interesting that you mentioned that period of its life when. Uh, the word depontification, if I could just... It, I, I think I made that up, Bishop. You Frank. did, but it's, it's accurate. I mean, it, it says what it means to say. Uh, and going back to the roots. See, part of what I think Christians, particularly Catholics, need to remember. So I'm going to lay this premise, and please, Peter, respond, all right? And take it apart if you wish. But the legacy of Christianity to the patrimony of humanity, especially the patrimony of the West, is thoroughly devalued, thoroughly unknown. Right? The church was at the heart of so much, whether you're talking about universities, whether you're talking about the hospital system, whether you're talking about health care or just uh, it's so, human services, that people forget we were really the protagonist of laying the seeds, right? So would it be fair to say that the originating force of the university in the West was the church, or is that overstating the case? No, I think that's exactly right. Um, Now, it is true that there were impulses uh, in the East uh, for the formation of centers of learning, uh, so-called, that ultimately became universities, but really the university that we know in the West Um, where young people go to be formed and educated and become what Pope Leo XIII calls the nation, the church, and the world's best citizens. Uh, That originated really in 
Italy and, and France uh, and in the heart of Europe uh, around the year 1000 to 1200. So, uh, you know, Oxford was founded then, uh, 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 Paris was founded then, Bologna. These were all from the heart of the church. And they grew out of the medieval schools. Uh, so there were typically schools that were associated with uh, cathedrals uh, that were uh, formed in at that time frame. And then these uh, universities grew out of those medieval schools to become uh, caretakers of, of the world of knowledge. And in the beginning, you know, knowledge was ordered around what's called the liberal arts, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the trivium and the quadrivium, uh, you know, a grammar rhetoric logic was the trivium. And then the quadrivium was the application of uh, quantification and uh, techne, uh, engineering, if you will, to uh, to uh, music and mm-hmm. astronomy and physics. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, but that's that was the, mm-hmm. the birth of the university mm-hmm. uh, in that time frame. And we're really the keepers of that. And in fact, one of the most important things about a Catholic university is that the knowledge that we uh, communicate to our students needs to be ordered in such a way that they understand that it's completely integrated. And unfortunately, most universities now are becoming what Alistair McIntyre calls multiversities. They become siloed and fragmented, and the knowledge is not integrated. And so one of our great projects here at the Catholic University of America is to demonstrate that all that knowledge is integrated and connected. And this is a really important point uh, because most people who run universities don't even understand that. So, right. That's, that is a phenomenally important point, right? It's interesting from what I recollect of church history Um, theology in these settings, in the earliest settings of the theology was considered the queen of the sciences. It still is. Exactly. That's exactly, amen. That's exactly the case. Because in theology, you see the fullness of the human person who who is addressed by the offer of grace. So here in Bridgeport, we talk about, you know, the mind, the heart, and the will, which is the traditional way of looking at a human being. You could use other terminology, but basically, so then all the different schools and all the different sciences have to all speak to each other because it's just the one human person that's being addressed. Exactly. Right. And, and I think in the end, part of what the world doesn't want to do and maybe this is a judgment on my part, forgive me, Lord, in the Easter season, but it's they don't want that dialogue because it will reveal the biases that some of the disciplines have or their incompleteness or they need to kind of give way to a larger worldview that their little world can't accommodate, right? So people silo because they're comfortable in their silos. <laughs> so if Catholic University, going back to its roots, introduces this, as you just said so well, this gr- um, grand dialogue, then it could be really the leader in the whole country of what a university should be, right? Is that too, I think that's fair to say, is it? <laughs> I do. Um, I, s- some of my colleagues at a few other Catholic colleges and, and yes, even universities are thinking very much in the same way. So uh, Benedictine University, mm-hmm. uh, University of Dallas. Uh, Hillsdale professes to be non-denominational, but I think I think it's really a Catholic place because it's run by Catholics. Um, so there are other universities in the country that are having this conversation. And it, at at root, what is it that unites all of knowledge? What is it that gives to the human person? their identity as Mm -hmm. being truly human. Well, it can only be one thing. It's the Lord. It's Jesus Christ. I mean, Gaudium et Spes in chapter 22 says, uh, man cannot know himself apart Mm -hmm. from Jesus Christ. And Mm -hmm. so you have, and, and I'm constantly reminded that Jesus in the gospel says, 
if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my heavenly father. And when I hear that, I'm like, oof, I, I, I almost need to grade myself on how many times publicly I say Jesus is at the center of our university. Jesus is at the center of our curriculum. Jesus is at the center of my life. How many, I need to grade myself and make sure that I'm professing him as Lord and, and master of my life, or I feel like I'm a traitor. Yeah, that's beautifully said. I mean, there are some controversial points that are all related to this, which I'm just going to throw out there, not necessarily that you need to react to, right, at all. But, uh, you know, there was a time when the universities, in dialogue with each other, were the referees of theological orthodoxy, that it did not require the congregation for doctrine of the faith or an individual bishop to correct because the universities corrected each other. And I'm praying we will go back to that because that's where the correction needs to be, colleague with colleague, right? You could think of, you know, even in, in the, the, the with St. Thomas, St. Bonaventure, they, they different viewpoints, different starting points, and their theology and those who had that patrimony continued to dialogue, correct? So that's one. Uh, the second is academic freedom. I always hear this, acad we, we ascribe to academic freedom. And quite honestly, Peter, I don't quite understand what the issue is because academic freedom, when understood correctly, means you could introduce uh, a controversial point in dialogue with the faith, but you can't introduce a controversial point without the faith being part of the conversation. Otherwise, it's a monologue. I would also, yeah, we, we have uh, grappled with this issue uh, very recently. Uh, ah. Yes, uh, because we've had a few, on occasion, we have a few issues with uh, faculty that, that we have to address. Uh, and I would say... What helps me understand academic freedom properly mm -hmm. is that Ex Court Ecclesia, you know, the Magna Carta of Catholic universities, mm -hmm. says that uh, we have the privileged responsibility to rigorously pursue the truth. Well, who is the truth? The truth mm -hmm. is a person. And so if we're rigorously pursuing the truth, we have to bring him into the conversation. And when we bring him into the conversation and there is a, an opinion or an idea which is opposed to the truth, they have to be in dialogue. Uh, otherwise, we're not rigorously pursuing the truth. So the Catholic understanding of academic freedom always has to engage the truth rigorously. In, in the person of Jesus. And, uh, you know, who is his body? Well, his body is the church. And exactly. so we have to bring the church into dialogue. And, and the master of this, I think, was, you know, the common and angelic doctor who, who knew yes. how to take a, 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 an opinion that he believed had flaws in it and raise it to a level where the argument was as solid and as compelling mm -hmm. as it could be. And then he would bring in mm -hmm. the opposing argument and he would be in dialogue and he did it. He did it compassionately. He did it gracefully. Uh, but he showed us how to have civil discourse on the most controversial topics. We need to reclaim that. We need to recover that. That's what academic freedom is. It's extremely well said. Yet in the end, there's a misnomer in the secular culture that we are afraid to engage questions, that we shy away from questions, that we ideologically respond to questions when that is the furthest from the truth. In, the, in what you just described, there is no question a Catholic should be afraid to grapple with if you're in dialogue exactly the way you described it, because it will always lead to the truth. 
right? That was John Henry Newman's point, right? It's this dude. And, and therefore, we're always mischaracterized by that. And to the extent that you're now in this position of leadership, which thank God you are, to the extent that you can begin this conversation at Catholic University and the others that you mentioned, and please God, others, we may be able to, to, to demonstrate to the larger world. Bring the questions. Bring them. And let's have a truly free conversation against the horizon of the truth. Yeah. Maybe we've been waiting for this for a very long time. Maybe the moment is now to start it. It's tremendous. We're ready. Yeah, yeah it's tremendous. Great. So uh, let me jump in here. Uh, we're, we'll take a quick break and come back with more of this conversation. Fascinating so far. Uh, this is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. His Excellency is speaking with Dr. Peter Kilpatrick, the president of the Catholic University of America, and we will be right back. If you're concerned about your end-of-life plans, searching for a Catholic cemetery, or have loved ones who are buried in one of the 14 Catholic cemeteries throughout Fairfield County, now might be a good time to begin planning for yourself or for other family members. Call one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 to leave a message or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Many people don't realize that they can be buried with their deceased loved ones, even if all of the family's in-ground plots have been taken. The Diocese of Bridgeport Catholic Cemeteries provides in-ground burials, as well as columbarium and mausoleum options. This makes it possible to unite your family together in the same cemetery, and it's an opportunity to build a bridge for your family back to the church. Talking about this issue is not easy, but pre-need planning makes your wishes clear, reduces cost, and helps your family avoid difficult decisions at a time of grief and loss. You can start your planning now by contacting one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. We can guide you through the options, regulations, and considerations to help you make the best decisions for your family. The number is 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Okay, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Uh, Bishop Caggiano is speaking with Dr. Peter Kilpatrick, the president of Catholic University of America, and I'll turn it right over to you, Excellency. Yeah. Well, first of all, th thank you for the first half because I thought it was fascinating. And this conversation about academic freedom it really gives me tremendous hope when it's seen in the light the way you described it. There's one other controversial issue, which again, I'm just going to put out there. You don't have to respond because I'm affected by it the same way. But when there is lifetime guaranteed employment, there are always issues. Whether there is tenure in the universities or ordination on the clerical side, meaning once you're ordained, you're ordained for life, unless something outrageous happens, and usually that outrageous is sinful. So I just mention that because our worlds uh, are not dissimilar insofar as people may be listening say, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Or why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? But there are natural limitations. It's more a question of conversion and inspiration than it is just a mandate. Is that is that for your shaking head? Is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah. Right. Yes, I think so, Bishop <laughs> Frank. It's um, <clears throat> uh, where I have seen the idea of tenure work well is when there's a culture of I will give to the institution until I'm not able to give productively because I'm a member of a community and I have a responsibility. So the university was gracious enough to grant me this job security, if you will. And my response, my duty in, re in response to that uh, grace that I was offered is that when I'm unable to be fully productive in my job as I was 10, 20, 30 years ago, I'll step down, I'll retire. And I've seen that work really well. So, for example, when I was dean of engineering at Notre Dame, the faculty understood that they had an obligation to the to the good of the school 
and of the university. And we had very few what I would call hangers on, um, you know, which is probably the way tenure should work. Um, Absolutely. Now, I've also seen it work not so well. Um, But um, we have to remember what tenure was instituted for. Tenure was instituted so to give faculty the freedom to pursue research questions that might be controversial. That, that was the whole point of tenure. Tenure was never intended as, uh, you know, lifetime job security until they put me in a box in the ground. Um, and so right. I think we've right. kind of lost right. uh, sight of what the original purpose of tenure was. And, and from, from my side of the equation, uh, of course, once a person is ordained, then there's sacramental character and you are a priest forever. Unto eternity, for all eternity, you are a priest. Um, so leadership in the church recognizes that fundamental ontological change in its priests and in its bishops. So when people become impatient because of the foibles of a pastor or a bishop, myself included, they do have to realize that we're on the road of conversion just as they are. Right, And when this works well in the nature of the church, there would be an open and honest dialogue that we are self-corrective, that we are also accompany each other in faith. Right? We're not a business. We're not a corporation with church. Right, So that's part of that too. Now, Peter, you have done some work and have, and have a great interest and have spoken on the relationship between I'm going to say science and faith, reason and faith, because that's very much at the heart of a university. And it seems that there are a, there are a lot of misconceptions in people's minds, particularly young people, right, on how these two are related. So your typical freshman coming to CUA, um, what, what's your hope to change or to help them to see differently them f- when they end their time as a senior, what they come in as a freshman, leaving as a senior, what's your hope for change in this question, leaving the university? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I have written on this um, uh, and I've given talks on this. My hope would be that the students ultimately come to learn, number one, that there's absolutely no conflict. There's no um there's no limitation of the areas of knowledge that can be pursued by either faith or by reason. Uh, the second thing I, I would hope that they would learn is that there are many ways to apprehend knowledge. So science is an inductive exercise. So we, we take observable data through the five senses Uh, We measure things and we collect enough data that we see trends and patterns. And then we propose theories or hypotheses. And then we test those hypotheses to try to prove or disprove them. But at root, science is an inductive method. It's not a deductive method. And yet deduction is still a perfectly valid way to come to knowledge and to reach conclusions. Um, Another important distinction is that science typically uses what I would call, or what St. Thomas Aquinas called ratio, which is a discursive type of reason that tends to break things up into pieces and study them individually. But there's another form of intellection that St. Thomas called intellectus, which is a way of perceiving things as a whole. It's, it's holistic reflection, and that's a perfectly valid way to come to knowledge. And so my hope for our students is that they would come to learn there are many ways to come to knowledge. Uh, this, the third thing that I would hope that they would learn is that any question is fair game, and the, and the deeper the question, the more closely you're going to approach the, re- the truth of the matter, the reality of the matter. So when I was a little kid, I used to bug my mom all the time and I would ask her why about everything. 
and she would give me her best answer. And then I would look at her and I say, well, why is that? And ultimately my mom would, would get a little impatient with me and she'd say, well, you know, I don't, I don't know how to answer that particular question, but why don't you go research it? What? And so I was constantly trying to get to the ontology of the issue, the source of being, you know, and I think that's another thing that I would hope our students get is that they would, they would question, who am I? Uh, they would ask the being questions. Who am I? What, what is the source of my reality? Why am I? Uh, what is my purpose as a person? Why is it that I can reflect on myself? Uh, we have no evidence that any other animal can do that except human persons. Uh, so I would hope that they would, they would ask these ultimate questions about reality and about being, because I think beginning to get answers to these ultimate questions helps them ask much more, much deeper questions about any area of specialization or any profession or anything that they go into. So a lot of our students will end up double majoring in philosophy or theology yeah. along with mm -hmm. their discipline, which is which I love because <clears throat> this is my hope is that they become integrated human persons that ask the deepest questions about reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I must confess one of my biases is as I've grown older, um, the fact that philosophy is not universally taught um, is a real loss. It is. For the very reasons that you are describing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we are very fortunate here at the Catholic University of America to have a wonderful school of philosophy, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they, in fact, we we kind of we we've, we've coined the expression. I've heard it used. They're, they've been the keep the keepers of the flame, um, and uh, now theology is is fantastic as well. Uh, I would argue they're both the keepers of the flame. Um, but we're, we've been really blessed to have good philosophy and theology here at our university. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And right. we have to continue to strengthen those, even in the face of a cultural trend towards students not majoring in philosophy and theology and, mm -hmm. and abandoning it. Mm -hmm. And many universities are abandoning philosophy and theology. Yeah. And what a tremendous loss. It's like going on to the ocean um, without a compass or without GPS. It's just you kind of like just meandering, right? That makes no sense to me. Anyway, now, uh, this I mean as a tremendous compliment. Your, your, your remarks are extraordinarily thoughtful. They are broad. They are genuine. They are authentically Catholic. So if I did not know you and your background, I would think you were either a theologian or a philosopher or a professional educator your whole life. And yet, your background is engineering, mm -hmm. at least your, your, your initial. So I'm fascinated. Um, what does engineering have to do with the act of faith? What, what has engineering taught you mm -hmm. that brought you to this point? Because I think the, the connection is just fascinates mm -hmm. me. It's a great question. And so I'm going to tell you a little story about a phase of my life. So mm -hmm. um, engineering and science always taught me to be very analytical, to be, and logical, to be very analytical and logical about everything and to be quantitative. So quantitative, analytical, logical. Um, when I converted and became Catholic, I took that analytical uh, quantitative, logical frame of reference, and I applied it to my faith. And my director of religious education, when I was, I call it a baby Catholic, I had just moved to North Carolina. He asked me to be an RCIA instructor. And I said, I said, Steve, why would you ask me to be an RCIA instructor? I don't know. I know almost nothing about the Catholic faith. I'm a brand new convert. I said, I've been through RCIA myself, but, and I know the creed, but 
you know, I don't, I don't know much theology. And he said, but you're a professor. I said, well, that's true. He said, you'll learn it. And so he started feeding me books. And I have to confess, not all the books were helpful. Uh, so I quickly learned that there's something called a Neil Obstat and an imprimatur. And I quickly learned that there was some confusion in the post-conciliar church about what the church teaches and how to understand it. And so I started developing a library. So in my office here, I have maybe four or 500 books, uh, maybe, a, maybe a little more than that. The vast majority of them are theology and philosophy. Um, wow. I've got a little shelf up there. Oh, yeah, some I see engineering yes. books, but everything oh, else you is go. <laughs> theology and philosophy. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit of a self-taught um, philosopher, theologian. And in fact, when I thought I was going to retire instead of taking this job, I was thinking of going to get a PhD in theology at uh, another university with a professor that I know. Um, but... Um, so maybe maybe the connection between engineering and philosophy and theology is that there's an intellectual rigor that you try to bring mm-hmm. to your study of a mm-hmm. subject mm-hmm. and maybe I've maybe I've taken a little bit of that rigor that I learned as a scientist mm-hmm. and an engineer to the study of philosophy and theology. Oh my gosh, but it shows that you've done if you're self-taught much of this, it's you've done the grace has worked remarkably in you. In, in many ways, well, in many ways your present position is what your entire life prepared you for. I've said that to myself several times in the last couple mm-hmm. of years and I can only attribute it to God putting a ring in my nose and saying come with me. Oh yeah. Yeah, well Join the rest of us. That's exactly how he operates. All right. So now, before we taped, you raised my one of my all-time favorite topics. We spoke a, a, t- a tad bit about astronomy, and that your son mm. has uh, has done work in astronomy. Has made so. I'm curious. What to tell me? What what is your son up to? And then you, by virtue <clears throat> of connection, too. So my son, I'm very proud. Well, I'm very proud of all my kids. They're wonderful. Wonderful young people or middle, maybe middle-aged people now. Um, <laughs> but my, my son, Charlie, um, is what's called an observational astronomer. So he, he takes uh, observations of uh, dynamic events in astronomy. Typically, well, he's an expert in what's called supernovae, which is when a star collapses on itself and then blows up. And, that's probably the majority of the research that he's done, but he's become, uh, he started learning more about other transient events. Um, so for example, in addition to supernovae, another important event that happens dynamically in, in our universe is when, uh, heavy objects collide with each other and either explode or merge and, because they're heavy, they, they create what's called a gravity wave. So you may know that there's an intimate link between uh, space and time, and there's a mm-hmm. framework whereby gravity operates, and gravity is only uniform if things are static. And if things are dynamic, if heavy objects are merging and, and you know, combining – there, it creates a little uh, oscillation in, in the gravitational field, and that's perceivable now by uh, devices called gravi- gravitational wave observatories. Or uh, one is called LIGO, uh, and one is called Virgo in, in uh, Europe. And so these things can detect when black holes merge, when two neutron mm-hmm. stars merge, when a neutron star and a black hole merges. And my son was the very first person to ever see the evidence of two neutron stars merging and then blowing up, essentially. 
And that, that wow. event is called a Kilanova. And it was predicted theoretically by Kip Thorne at Caltech back in the 1970s, 1980s. And the first observation of one was in 2017 when this gravitational wave observatory came online. And, and my son Charlie was fortunate enough to be able to uh, figure out how to go look for it and find it. Um, wow. He's done a lot of other things, but that's probably his most famous uh, discovery. But uh, he's very uh, committed to um, this transient astronomy. And it's, it's kind of neat to see him get the bug that his dad had, you know, for doing science. And, um, yeah. and my, my older yeah. son, Zachary, does the same thing, but he does it in neuroscience. So they're, you know, uh -huh. both of them said, I want to do it, anything except what dad does. And it turns out both <laughs> of them are doing what dad did. So the apple doesn't fall far from Not the tree very far in at some all. ways. No, but the interesting thing is, and we were chatting before we went on for our recording, the more I like this, I find I, this, I find fascinating. And in part, not because I'm any great astronomer, nor am I scientifically trained, or, but because it inevitably raises those ultimate questions that you referred to before. It does. So one of, to me, right. one of the most stunningly uh, interesting observations about the universe. I, I'm a thermodynamic. I was a, I was a thermodynamist in a previous life uh, in chemical engineering, and much of what I studied, emulsion science, colloid interfacial science, revolved around what's called thermodynamics. And I, and I taught thermodynamics, you know, for many many years. But one of one of the concepts in thermodynamics is that the universe. Um, tends towards greater and greater entropy, which means disorder. So if we, if we look at the universe, you know, there's a theorem, the second law of thermodynamics that says uh, an enclosed system will tend towards the greatest disorder or greatest entropy. And yet our universe has been observed to have remarkably low entropy, much lower than you would ever expect were our universe to be a, a result of random forces. So for example, mm -hmm. our universe is very two dimensional. It's very flat and physicists and, and astrophysicists have no explanation for this. Now what they, what they do to try to explain why is our universe such a, unusually uh, constrained uh, closed system is they propose, well, that there must be an infinity of universes. It's called the multiverse. And yet there's absolutely no evidence for this. And, and there are even physicists now who are developing uh, theories that um, basically say it, there can't be an infinity of universes. There have Either there's a few or there's one. Um, and so, again, this raises that ultimate question. Uh -huh. Why does our universe look so incredibly designed? Why are the physical constants of the universe constrained within such very narrow limits mm -hmm. for life mm -hmm. to exist in our universe? Mm -hmm. there, there are mm -hmm. all these questions and... You know, candidly, I, I do not find good answers from physicists today for these questions other than if, if the universe obeys laws and if the universe appears to be designed, then there must be a lawgiver and a designer. There must be. It, it, reason, again, all of our knowledge doesn't come from induction and, and evidence a lot of our knowledge just comes from deduction and logic. Right. And if the universe right. appears incredibly designed, constrained, and obeys laws, who's the lawgiver? And to, to me, right. there's, only, there's only one credible answer. 
Um, because right. as St. Paul says in Romans, you know, he designed the world in such a way that just through our reason, we can come to these conclusions. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, I think Father Spitzer's book uh, uh, is a real contribution um, to this debate between faith and reason. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I look forward to having these conversations with others and uh, really sort of delve. In fact, we're, we're looking to stand up an institute here of, on faith and science. Um, oh, oh yeah. really? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. excellent. Well, we think it's important. Um, we, we, you know, we don't want the purveyors of scientism to co-opt the whole conversation about science. We, we want, we want people to come together and have this deep dialogue about the best science, the best induction, mm-hmm. the best evidence, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the best logic, the best reason, the best, you know, how, how the complementarity of faith and reason that enables us to go deeply into these topics. Yeah, you know, it's, I think that's brilliant uh, uh, and long overdue. Because it's, it's one of the few prisms that most young people, and now those of us who are older, are operating under, and we don't even know we're colored by the mm. prism. Because the secular culture is leading us to these unexpressed but, but still present conclusions that block the act of faith. That's correct. There's, in the average there's a beautiful book mm-hmm. that one of my colleagues here at uh, Catholic University wrote called No God, No Science. Um, His name's Michael Hanby, and uh, I could go grab it off my shelf, but um, it's a a very deep, deep philosophical book. But essentially, Mm -hmm. it says, I think, what I just said a few minutes ago, that if the universe is ordered, and it is ordered, if the universe obeys mm-hmm. laws, if there is structure to the universe, um, reason dictates that there is some cause cause of all that structure and law, and uh, you know that's just that's just common sense essentially. Uh, mm-hmm. Now he says it in fifty pages using philosophical language, but. I'm pretty sure that's the essence of his argument. Right. And if I may, Peter, and if, if, if I could use this terminology, and therefore the natural revelation of that which exists points to the existence of a God, then revelation reveals that God to be personal, that God to be inviting, and that God entered into the creation that was made in large part to serve us to glorify him and reveal that love on the cross. What an extraordinary affirmation to make about us and about God. Absolutely. Extraordinary. This is what we just celebrated. <laughs> this is the Paschal right? mystery that we're entering into tomorrow. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Fascinating. Thank God you are where you are. You have my prayers for sure and my support, and I'm sure my brother Bishop's support, support right across the well, country. Well, thank you, Bishop Frank. We would we would love to have more students from the Diocese of Bridgeport and all across the country, and mm-hmm. I'm trying to draw mm-hmm. as close as I can to all the bishops, uh, You know, trying to visit mm-hmm. as many of them as I can. And I'm grateful mm-hmm. uh, to my good friend, uh, Deacon Patrick Tool you know, for introducing us uh, and for oh, enabling yes, this yes, conversation. Yes. I've known Pat since uh, I was the Dean of Engineering at Notre Dame. He's a, he's a good man. Oh, he's a good man. He's long overdue for this podcast too. I've spared him, but now I think it's time to come out because Pat is brilliant, but he always works in the, you know, behind the scenes. It's time to bring yeah. him forward. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Bishop. Okay, let's take one more break, and we'll be back with a listener question. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. His Excellency has been speaking with Dr. Peter Kilpatrick, the president of Catholic University, and we will be right back. Hey, 
It's Matt from Restless on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network. Each week on Restless, we young adults restlessly seek the face of Christ in today's crazy and mixed up world. Join us each Friday at noon on 1350 AM, 103.9 FM, the Veritas app, or wherever you get your shows. Hope to see you there. Okay, welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. All right, Excellency, I love this question that came in. So here it is. Mm-hmm. The, the listener writes, what do you think is the most important passage in the Bible? And is there one that kind of sums up everything? Well, it's interesting. I mean, important, they're all important. I mean, it's all revelation. Um, sums up, my, I, I would have always have said John 3, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that those who believe him may have eternal life. But actually, I'm going to co-opt the question, and I'm going to say, what's the most poignant line in sacred scripture? And until recently, I would have said to you, as I said before in this podcast, you know, it's Pontius Pilate's question to Jesus, what is truth? It's still up there, but there's another one now that captivates me. And it's at the Last Supper. And when Jesus reveals to Judas, to the group, that Judas was betrayer, and Scripture says, and of course Judas departed, and then it says, and it was night. And that image of inviting the night, the darkness, should be the cause for every Christian to reflect upon. Because we invite the night when we are people of the light. And that could be a matter of, of, of examination of conscience for every Christian every night before he or she goes to bed. Amen. Okay. So if you have a question for Bishop Frank, send it in on social media. You can email questions at veritascatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and so is Veritas Catholic Network. And we would like to thank our sponsor, Foundations in Faith. Foundations in Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport, and you can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.org. And Dr. Peter Kilpatrick, uh, obviously a man of science, obviously a man of faith, and the president of Catholic University of America. Thank you so much for uh, joining us on Let Me Be Frank today. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Bishop Frank. It was a, a real joy and pleasure for me to be with you today, and I really enjoyed the interview. Thank you, Peter. And you, and really, you have my prayers, my support, and uh, and please, God, if I could be of any help to you, I appreciate that. Give me appreciate a buzz. It. I'd love to come mm-hmm. visit your schools in Bridgeport. Oh yeah, come, come. There, it, we have a, a a flowering here. Our attendance is up. Uh, lots of great work being done, apologetic work being done in our high schools. Oh yeah, you're most welcome. Would love to, to come. come. And by the way, our our tagline, our new brand, y- you'll like huh? this is "Lead with Light." Oh, I love it. So you know our our motto is "Deus lux mea est." God is my light. So our new tagline yeah. is "Lead with Light." I love it. And the website for the school, Dr. Kilpatrick, it's catholic.edu, correct? Uh, And cua.edu. Okay. Catholicuniversityofamerica.edu. Either one gets you there. Great. So before we go, Excellency, would you please give us your blessing? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. amen. In the light of Easter, life and Love, we give you thanks, Almighty God, for granting us the promise of eternal glory and peace in your Son, Jesus. May these days of Easter be a time of rest and renewal for us, for all who profess the faith, and for all people of goodwill. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Happy Easter to you all. Happy Easter, Bishop Frank. Great to be with you. Thank you. God bless you.